Hello, welcome to the Law of the Gosh podcast. Today is January 19th, 2017. Um, we're a day away from Donald Trump's inauguration to be president. That sounds very surreal to say, but that's where we're at. Um, so this will be kind of a inauguration special. And today I'm here with Khalid Barawi, I believe I'm saying that is that. correct. Barawi, and to give you some background on Khalid, Khalid was born and raised in Morocco, in a Sunni Islam family household. He studied management in a French school in Morocco, and moved to the U.S. for management training. Uh, he fell in love with the country, and decided to stay. He applied for citizenship, which was granted to him in 2013, and he has recently become more interested in activism and supporting oppressed minorities in his country of birth. And he now is managing an online community page to support Moroccan ex-Muslims and atheists. And what I found interesting about Khalid when I was uh, speaking to him recently over chat was that he was also a Trump supporter. And I briefly started asking him about the reasons that he came to this conclusion to support Trump. But I thought this would make for a very interesting conversation for the podcast. Um, a lot of the backlash against Trump and his support has been about his anti-immigration policies, um, some racial bigotry. And so I find it fascinating when I come across someone who is from a different culture, a different country, and yet supports Trump. So I think it's good to extend a hand and try to understand the mentality of why somebody is supporting Trump. Personally, I'm not a Trump supporter, so it should make for a very interesting conversation. So welcome, Khalid. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> no problem. So, uh... Can you uh, add a little bit more to your background there? I think you've covered it all. I think uh, I think uh, what I would add is that when it came to the United States, I fell in love with with the country, but specifically with its constitution. Uh, I through the years I understood what the constitution represented. I fell in love with the values of freedom and liberty. Uh, something that is though Morocco is kind of a uh, compared to some other countries in the region. Uh, you are pretty, f I mean, free to do certain things, and uh, it's not full freedom the way we, we know it here, but I learned uh, how to appreciate uh, the values of freedom and the values of, in my opinion, one of the most, if not the most, amazing constitution in the world. So that's one of the reasons why I decided to apply for citizenship. So can I for, first ask you your background um, as far as uh, growing up a Sunni Muslim in Morocco, were your parents more liberal, more moderate, more conservative? Uh, that is a great question. Uh, yes, they are liberals. Actually, they, they practice Sunni Islam, but it's a very liberal uh, version, moderate version of, 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 of Islam. I would say, I think it came from, if you, we go 500 Years back, it came from Al Andalus, Islamic Spain. My mom, uh, my mom's background is Andalusian. There's a there's there are a few Andalusian uh, families in Morocco, and I think that that's one of the most uh, actually mostly the, the Islam Islam in Morocco is is mostly moderate. But but I just want to give the example of Andal Andalus because it was a very tolerant, uh, very intellectual uh, kind of Islam, and it's also kind of a Sufi version, meaning in Morocco uh, people. Focus on Ramadan, doing Ramadan as, as something spiritual, for example. But not everybody prays, for example. So uh, Morocco also, a lot of Moroccans uh, consume alcohol heavily. <laughs> it's one of the most, uh, you know, uh, alcohol is, is really not a taboo, for example, like it, it is, for example, in Saudi Arabia or places like Iran, other places. 
So yes, I grew up in a family with very liberal values, but also a spiritual. Mm, we did practice Ramadan, and my mom prays five times a day, but she's really a, a kind of uh, she only picks and chooses the good things in Islam and and rejects or, th- or thinks the, those other things that were within Islam uh, uh, belong to that seventh century, and 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 it really does not make sense for us to to focus on them right now. Uh, she also does not know about certain things in Islam, as I didn't myself, because that's something that we don't talk about in Morocco, and even the system does not, the, the government or political system does not actually talk about these things, or even the manuals uh, or uh, the programs at school teaching Islam do not teach the violent side of Islam. It's only a kind of a tamed version of Islam that serves the interest of of, of, of the kingdom, meaning Morocco has a king, and he gets his legitimacy from uh, having uh, or from Islam. So that's why we are not a secular country. That's why we're kind of a hybrid between an Islamic and a liberal kind of mix. And you know, in most homes in Morocco, uh, it's 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 uh, most have very liberal values. I'll give you an example. For example, my sister still is still a Muslim, but she wears bikinis, for example, uh, just to give you an example of that. So yes, I grew up in a very liberal uh, home. Uh, I mean, my sister was I mean, free to do whatever she wanted to do. Uh, can I ask you to kind of get a feel for the timeline? You were born in Morocco and you lived there up until what age? And then you went to the United States and how long have you been there? So I grew up in Morocco uh, and I, you know, I traveled back and forth, but I, but I moved to the United States at the age of 27. And I've been here for 10 years straight, like without moving back and forth. So that's a good amount of time in both countries. And Morocco is not one of the countries I'm too familiar with as far as like politics or society. One of my best friends who is Muslim is from Morocco. Also, you know, very, yeah. very liberal girl. And she always, you know, talks about how liberal and much more free society. I would like to ask you, though, having you had this experience in both cultures very well and you were talking about the constitution despite what we hear about how uh, morocco is much more liberal compared to other muslim majority societies how would you compare it to the u.s yeah that's a great question let's talk about women's rights for example Mm -hmm. uh women women in the united states are protected they are free and I will give the example of rape, for example. Cases of rape in, in the United States are, are treated with, with, a lot of, uh, it, 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 with a lot of focus and, and, and uh, with, uh, you know, punishment usually is very severe. Uh, in Morocco, however, uh, when, if a, if a, if a rape, rape case happens, if a woman gets raped uh, and she goes, for example, to report it to the police, the police would first look at the way she's dressed and so forth, and they might make comments about it. If the girl that, w- the girl that was raped is no, it wasn't a virgin before getting raped, they might not even consider the case. And even if you actually prove that you were raped, right, and the person gets, gets actually uh, you know, caught and, 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 and sentenced, the maximum sentence is five years. So that is kind of the, uh, to give you an idea about the difference between the two countries when it comes to that. Women can still work. Women, we have amazingly smart women in Morocco. I have to point that out. Maybe like your, your friend uh, you've talked about. And they're, they're very smart. And we have women that are doctors, lawyers, and things like that. And they don't have to cover. And they, if they choose to cover, they can. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of struggle. It's a, still a patriarchal society, right? Men still have the upper hand. And so it's one of the things I'm fighting against uh, in my social media life, um, kind of to fight against that mentality. And I find it interesting that the Moroccan guys that left Islam have become a lot more tolerant towards minorities, like gay people, uh, and a lot more, they work, they're work, working more as a team with women. And as a protective kind of he for she mentality, I have to mention that a lot of Muslims are liberal and they believe in women's rights and all that. But a society as a whole, a Moroccan society, uh, it, it is not 
it is not as good to women uh, as 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 the West or the United States is not even close. So. Yeah, um, even in for example in Chile, I would say that it's much more liberal, obviously, than you'll find a lot of places in the world, and it's also very advanced society, democratic now, uh, pretty good on most uh, c civil rights issues. However, I would say that the majority of the societal problems it has if not around 90% of them are rooted in Christianity, specifically Catholicism, although evangelicals make up a very big part of the country and they do have a lot of power, uh, special fi especially financial power and governmental power. And, uh, you know, a lot of these problems are rooted in, you know, homophobia, women's rights. It's one of the only six countries in the world that I think completely uh, prohibit abortion on any level, even if the woman's life is in danger, if it's an inviolable fetus, whatever it is, um, there's still, you know, uh, there's a, a kind of an, an aversion to contraception as a whole, um, just mm -hmm. con uh, problems like that. And I would say most of those problems, the overwhelming majority, are rooted in re religion. And the more religious the people are, the more they tend towards the more conservative position on those issues, right? More probably homophobic they are, more probably reserved about women's issues, et cetera. Uh, would you, say, would right. you say the same thing about Morocco? That is absolutely right. Uh, though there are a few differences uh, when it comes to abortion, for example. Uh, if it's, if it's a life-threatening issue, then we could. Abortion would be allowed in Morocco, which is very interesting. But if a woman gets pregnant uh, outside of marriage and things like that, abortion is very is still legal. It's actually taboo, and uh, and it through like my uh, my actual uh, platform that I talked about. Uh, I was involved in uh, in actually one case uh, to help a, gr a girl who got pregnant and. Uh, who needed a, who needed assistance to 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 have abor an abortion? Well, doctors actually are available, but it's 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 still illegal, unfortunately. So, uh, imagine a, a woman in a Muslim country, though it's not a Saudi Arabia kind of Muslim country, but if she gets pregnant and has the baby, she will have a problem with her family and a huge problem in her school in her entire. Uh, you know, surrounding. I mean, everybody would be judging her. She wouldn't be able to finish school and things like that. So it's a very, very tough problem. And and even babies' uh, results, the results of um, sex outside of marriage, are still looked at as as non good, not good babies or some sort of. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it exists in Christianity, but but I, I have an idea about it. it. It might. So those babies are not considered as good babies and. A lot of women from a very disadvantaged background end up throwing their babies, uh, unfortunately, because of these, uh, because of that. And to add another example, you mentioned homophobia. Homophobia is cultural. It's a, again, it's a patriarchal society. So a lot of atheists are actually still homophobic, um, but uh, Islam, because uh, Islam appeared in the seventh century Arabia in a very patriarchal society. It includes homophobia, and Islam used some of the texts from Christianity and Judaism, which were homophobic. And there is, the Quran is highly homophobic. It talks about the punishment of Gomorrah and Sodom and all that. And uh, in the Hadith, it talks very, very specifically about punishing homo uh, so homosexuals. Uh, and some of the Sahaba, a lot of Muslims don't know that, but I invite them to read those details about it, some Sahaba actually did execute hom uh, homosexuals by throwing them from high high buildings, or by burning them alive, uh, and that happened. And ISIS is doing the same thing today. Morocco does not do that to homosexuals. Uh, they occasionally get beaten up, or actually, there is a law against the act of having sex uh, between two men, for example, or two women. Uh, being a gay person does, doesn't send you to jail, but if you get caught having sex with, a, uh, I mean, a male having sex with another man, uh, they can be uh, sentenced to up to four to five months in prison. And if it gets 
out in the media, then the, the government feels pressure to actually prosecute these people. But usually they kind of, uh, you know, they, they look the other way and they try not to, to apply that. But it, it is a law that, that it is there. Uh, it's uh, in Moroccan law is a mix of French laws and a little bit, a little hint of Sharia law in there <laughs> still. So, well, okay. Well, this is a good segue to kind of ask you about, because it seems like for the most part, you're more leaning towards liberal ideas. It seems that this is what attracted you to the U S however, you're a Trump supporter. And I think you said you voted for him because now you can vote because you're a citizen. Yes, I voted for him. Yes. So Correct. how did you come to that conclusion in general, if you could just kind of summarize it? Well, well you say that I'm a liberal. I'm a socially a liberal, uh -huh. but fiscally conservative. Okay. okay. So I moved to the United States. And when I moved to the United States, I was very attracted and fascinated by the idea of having a black president. Uh, you know, uh, in, in 2008, like my year after... I moved, officially moved to the United States, uh, a black president got elected. And I didn't just focus on the fact that he, he's a black president, but also listen to him, listen to his ideas without really having a deep understanding of, what, of American politics and not even a deep understanding of the American constitution at the time. But I was hearing slogans like change. Okay, change is, is good, but... You know, when you when I uh, through the years, I start, you know, when I started analyzing those initial speeches where he goes, I want to fundamentally change the United States after I had understood what the Constitution stands for and here in fundamentally changing. No, I don't want anybody to fundamentally change the, the Constitution of the United States. It's just great. I want somebody who can protect the, the values within the Constitution of the United States. And that person does not have to be Trump. It really, when I like, when I like, when I vote for someone or, or the idea of voting for somebody, I really vote for the ideas I agree with. I look at the number of ideas, I analyze them, and I actually read what his plan is. I read the 100-day plan in detail. I've listened to every single speech. I've listened to every single uh you know debate and uh, are you are you saying of trump right now you've seen every speech and debate of trump well now the, the, there's not a lot of <laughs> of debates right now uh, with trump but yeah. yeah i've seen i've seen uh, you know everything i mean recently i haven't had the, the opportunity to watch the find that that the press conference where he told the cnn guy to leave yeah. I don't I think mean, I but that. just I was I'm asking like in general you would say that you saw a quite a lot of speeches and you got a lot of background information on Trump prior to voting. Right. So yeah. the idea the point I'm trying to make is that I did not make my 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 I mean, did not make up my mind based on little videos and snippets on AJ Plus or some liberal media outlets. Okay. I watched his speech entirely. I analyzed the context and I make made up my own mind. I mean, I, I, I got, I extracted the information and understood it on my own without having somebody translate it for me into their media lingo. So basically, uh, and, and I have to mention that when I agree with somebody, I agree with particular ideas and I've never agreed with someone on absolutely everything. That's, uh, there's a quote I, I often say, Agreeing with someone on absolutely everything is a sign of insanity. So you have to agree on the things that make sense and agree to disagree on things that don't make sense to you. If Trump says things, and he has, that didn't make sense to me, I, just, I would go, okay, I don't agree with that. But what, what uh, topics did you particularly agree on with him that called your attention? Because I have to say... To me, uh, to me, he didn't really say anything that particularly attracted me on social issues or international issues. Uh, he he seemed uh, at, at some point he said he wanted to open libel laws to kind of be able to sue the press for either being dishonest or just flat out negative stories. In either case, I think it's a bad idea. Um, he's he said he's uh, against 
abortion. He said he's against gay marriage. Um, Why just did he say that? Uh, against gay marriage? Yes, I have oh, to. He, uh, he has said that. Okay, well, I have to see the full context. Again, yeah, that, yeah. That's, the, that's the issue. Well, uh, I mean, just this is my this is my point of view. I mean, it, it doesn't really matter too too much right now for you, but I, <laughs> cause, because I I kind of want to know what you heard that uh, appealed to you. All right, so let's let's give the examples. Uh, the example, the first example I will give you is for his first speech. Right, he talked about illegal immigration, and he mentioned that there are a lot of drug dealers, a lot of uh, you know rapists, and a lot of uh, criminals crossing through the borders and creating trouble, creating problems. And he wants to make sure that we close the borders, secure the borders, and only vet the people that actually can or are qualified to come in and for us to know who they are and for us to, you know, basically get people who are not going to be, make, you know, bringing drugs and, 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 and doing uh, uh, all sorts of, all sorts of crimes and things like that. But the fact that he mentioned Mexicans, people focused on that and they, they mixed the, the expression Mexicans with drug dealers and they said, okay, Mexicans, oh, Trump just said that every Mexican is a drug dealer. That is, not, that is simply not true. That is simply out of context. And that's not what he said. But what I like about this idea is that, first of all, there's a lot of illegal immigration and a lot of it, uh, that illegal immigration actually hurts those people who try to cross a lot of people actually die trying, and, 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 and there are a lot of people who actually cross, and some women get raped, and I mean, some women, undocumented women, get raped and decide not to call the cops because they are scared to be deported. So instead of having people cr cross through without having an actual border, I would say close the borders, Open up for visas for people who actually want to come here, for us to know who they are, and you know create opportunities for good abiding citizens. At the same time, people who are used to crossing, who want to cross, now they're going to see that there is a border that is secured. They're going to stop trying, and it's going to cause less people to die as they cross the borders. A lot of people don't talk about that. So that's what I like, and, and I interpreted it in my own way, but that's, that's, that's what I like about that idea of, of, of immigration. People need to be protected under the law when they immigrate. They need to have, they need to be documented. That we need to know who they are, and they need to be paying taxes. And every single country, uh, I would say, uh, has some sort of protection around the borders. Uh, you know, if you talk about the United, uh, the, uh, I mean, if you talk about Europe, Europe have a Schengen system, and it's a different, it's kind of a different system. But outside of the Schengen, you still have borders protecting Europe. So we need to have that because of a lot of threats. Morocco has borders too, and nobody criticizes Morocco because it's Morocco. Everybody wants to focus and criticize the United States, uh, but I think it's a legitimate, it's a legitimate point. We need to have secure borders, and people who deserve to be here need to be allowed. I, I, I would advocate for opening it up for visa. So that's that's the number one. Can I ask you on that, though? Yeah. Um, I kind of want to know, when you came to the U.S., were you still a Muslim? And if you were, whether you were or not, how do you feel about the fact that oh, uh, Trump wants to kind of close down immigration completely for Muslims and even wants to create a registry for them? That is a great question. I like that you asked that. Actually, when I applied for a, a visa to come to the United States, I went through administrative proce proce proceeding and I had to wait for six months uh, before because of my name. And I was a Muslim and it did not bother me one bit. And I was completely a liberal and you know, I wasn't. I didn't even know a lot about the conservative values or the Republican Party, but I was okay with that. And I'm saying the truth. I was okay with that because I knew that if the United States is doing this, that means once once I'm there, I know I'm, I'm protected. I know that they vet everybody, and I know that every, only people who are actually uh, vetted, who, who are actually safe to come, are allowed to come to the United States. So that registry existed. Not in the not not the way the media actually now presented. 
oh, there is a registry, you're going to have a badge and you're going to walk around with a croissant on your face or something like that. No, that's a registry or a, a database that existed before Obama and Obama kept it up until 2012, uh, sorry, 2011. If you came from any of these countries, you had to go through some sort of proceeding and they had to check your name. And my file had to be, I mean, checked in D.C. So I applied in, for visa in, in Morocco and they had, and, and my file went to D.C. And sometimes it, it, when, I tried, when I tried to check on my status, they said, we will get back to you. Some of the files stayed in D.C. for two years, three years before it went uh, forward. So I have no problem with that. And I tell, I'll give you an example. Morocco has a total shutdown on immigration coming from Afghanistan, total shutdown on immigration coming from Iran, total shutdown coming, uh, on immigration coming from Iraq, total, almost total shutdown on immigration coming from Syria. And almost, I think now, total shutdown on immigration coming from, from Libya. And Morocco has been very safe. For the, for the last few years, we only had two terrorist attack, attacks in 2003, one in 2003 and one in 2011, because the Moroccan system of, of uh, national security is very, very effective. It almost, and it's not politically correct. It's very close, very similar to the Israeli system when it comes to national security. People's safety comes first. And... Whether, you know, the, you know, the narrative about, oh, my God, you're, you're actually labeling people or you're actually uh, profiling people. No, it's not the case. We, Mor Mor I'm talking about Morocco now, as a Muslim country is banning people from coming to, from another country that is known for, for terrorism. It's not Islamophobic. It's just a security procedure. And the fact that Obama talked about that, I think it makes me feel safe. I think it's, he's not doing that. I'm sorry, not Obama, Trump. Talk about that. It makes me feel safe, the fact that we're, we're able to vet those people and check them before they, before they come. I'll, get one more, I'll add one more point. Last year, I watched a debate. Uh, it was like a question. Uh, the assistant, uh, the assistant's, uh, uh, assistant of uh, Homeland Security director was asked that Congress uh, about how many Americans uh, were or went to Syria or came back from Syria, and she could not provide a number. I have friends from Syria who are very safe, to be honest, but they've been able to go to Syria and come back. Nobody asked them why they went and came back. That is very dangerous. We don't have a system that prevents that, so we need it. But can but I can I ask you? Um... So when you took uh, the test for the visa, they were vetting you for the visa, and also during the naturalization process when you became a citizen, did they ever ask you about your religion? Was it ever clarified that you're a Muslim? I think uh, I think on my initial visa, I can't really remember, but not on the citizenship. I think on my initial visa, I'm not sure. I can't remember really, to be honest. But so it, let's say it, if Trump wants to shut down any immigration and like you were talking about Mor Morocco, but it sounds like Morocco distinguishes by nationality, not by religion. But Trump is talk has not said anything about shutting down immigration from certain areas of the world. He says uh, it shut it down the immigration of Muslims and and create a registry of any immigration of Muslims maybe uh, coming to the United States, which in the case when you came to the United States let, let, uh, would affect you. So let's say in the case when you, when you wanted to go to the United States, you wouldn't have in, in the, under the, the philosophy of, of Trump shutting down immigration of Muslims. Are you okay with that? Okay. Well, I'll answer point by point. Fantastic questions. I'm glad you're asking those questions. The first question about whether, you know, it would be okay to, uh, to to vet to vet the person uh, uh, by religion, I don't think it's Trump mentioned the religion on his hundred day plan. He did mention on the first time he said, "Well, uh, total shutdown on Islamic or Muslim immigration." It was a mistake the way he said it. It came across as Muslim immigration from uh, as people of faith, but he's talking about Islamic countries. He also. 
never said that he's going to register as Muslims or he never confirmed that. There was something that a reporter asked him and he came across as he was saying, yes, whatever. I, I don't really, I couldn't see anything in that interview that said that in, in which Trump went, yes, I will go ahead and 100% will create a registry of every Muslim coming to the country or every Muslim who lives in the country, which is not absolutely not true. So when he, if you read his 100 day plan, or if you watched his 100 days uh, speech talking about the plan, uh, he does not mention that. He does not mention the registration of Muslims. He says total freeze or total suspension of immigration coming from countries in which immigrants from which immigrants cannot be safely vetted and it would not have affected me because morocco is not one of these countries obviously and i'm not saying that we should limit the opportunities for people that are coming from countries that are other than morocco but it's it's Today, we, we're facing a safety issue that we have to be very, very serious about. What's been happening in France, Paris, Nice, Brussels, and some other countries, like a couple of times in Turkey and so forth, we have to take this seriously. A lot of people talk about terrorism, and they go, well, you have less chances to die by terrorism or by act of terrorism than by, let's say, Furniture falling on you, like uh, Riza Aslan said. That is not a very smart narrative, because let's take that. If you take that that uh, analysis and go, okay, well, it's not. I will never. I will never have a problem with terrorism. I will never die with terrorism. That's really a slim thing. So we, let's not focus on it at all. Let it grow until they they get their hand on them most powerful weapons, or maybe the nuclear weapon, then it will be 100% chance. Okay, well, let, then um, let, let me um, kind of throw you out my impression of Trump with Islam, and you can respond to a, to a question I have with it. Um, so my aversion, my opposition to Trump on international issues, uh, especially with Islam, I see a lot of people online constantly saying trump is tougher on islam he's you know he's much stronger on islam than obama than hillary they are not completely wrong when it comes to his rhetoric he does speak tougher against islam i think it's a big mistake on the part of obama and hillary to kind of avoid the the term islam completely to say it to constantly point out this has nothing to do with the religion i think that rubs a lot of people in the united states the wrong way um there, there's definitely there could be a way to talk about it without demonizing the muslims in your own country or demonizing the rest of the world while still recognizing that there is such a thing as whatever you want to call it you know jihad radical islam my but my problem with when people say that he's tougher on it is that despite the softer rhetoric from hillary or, or obama i think they definitely without a doubt understand the middle east and understand the conflict within the religion and the different sects and the the cultural differences better than trump Say what you want about Hillary, and there's plenty of bad things to say about Hillary, but she definitely understands, for example, the Sunni-Shia conflict better than Trump. She understands the difference between Iraq and Saudi Arabia and Iran and the conflicts between them better than Trump. Now, despite her rhetoric, when it comes to, uh, down to actually making decisions based on knowledge, I think Trump is walking into the White House completely ignorant, despite him saying... You know, there's a problem here and people are attracted to that because everyone knows there's a problem. Right. But and that that was kind of dismissed a little bit too much by Hillary Clinton in the debates and Obama in his speeches. And he takes questions and he's like, this is why I don't say Islamic uh, radical Islam. Uh, I, I don't think that comforted people when it comes to wars in the Middle East or terrorism, uh, homeland terrorism. So. Do, what do you think that Trump can offer the the problem with 
domestic terrorism or the conflicts in the Middle East that Hillary c can't. Right. Well, let me address first the fact that Hillary Clinton, you said she knows the Middle East, right? Better than Trump, I said. Right. So right. Yeah. let's let's assume that. Let me yeah. give you an example of somebody that knows how to drive, right? And somebody that you don't know if they, they know how to drive. You, you, you haven't seen them driving. But you know somebody knows how to drive very well, but they're really a big fan of speeding and crazy, reckless driving. Knowing how to drive does not necessarily mean that you're going to be driving very well. You know what I mean? It's the same. I'm giving an example uh, by using the driving part, just like with, with Hillary Clinton, knowing the Middle East, but making the wrong decisions. She made the wrong decision on, the decisions on Libya by actually Obama and her, not, him, not her by herself, because I think it's unfair to tell that that, 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 that was her, her, her mistake by herself. It was, a, it was a joint mistake between her and Obama. Going into Libya was a terrible mistake. And it's not an error. They made the decision. It was the bad decision. Supporting, sending weapons to, let's not, let, let me not mention ISIS. I'm going to mention groups that are very, very similar to ISIS that have a goal to control S Syria under Sharia law and behead people and do and commit atrocities, but under the U.S. government list of terrorist organizations, they are not on there. Jaish al-Islam is not on there. Ansar al-Sham is not on there. There is even al-Nusra to, to a certain to, a, to at some point was not on there. And these people are getting weapons. They have the exact same ideology than as ISIS. Uh, I'm not a conspiracy theory theorist, but these guys are considered by the United States as the uh, free Syrian army. It isn't. It is a free Islamic fundamentalist army uh, with different groups of them. So yes, Hillary understands the, the Middle East and the culture, uh, and the culture and everything, but I, I, would, I would think that she maybe doesn't understand Syria, but I, I, I bet she does. She just makes the wrong decisions. Her and Obama did make the wrong decisions. Well, what makes but, you think and, that Trump will make better decisions? What I like about Trump is that he recognizes the problem, right? O uh, Obama and Hillary do not recognize the problem. They do not admit that this comes from Islamic fundamentalism. They don't call it Islamic fundamentalism because they don't like to use the word radical. It's actually applying Islam 100%. It's not radicalizing or changing the message. It is the actual Islam 100% the same way it was preached by Muhammad and the same way it was, I mean, it went on with his uh, khulafa or the, the people who succeeded him. So, Well, you're going to get no is, argument from me on that. I, I completely agree with you, but yeah. Yeah, I understand. Uh, but uh, that it is because I studied Islam. I studied the books of Hadith, which is I can mention. And if, he, if anyone would like to debate me on that, I'm, I'm open to do that. I'll host uh, it. I'm, I'll have you host that, get that <laughs> podcast. Right. If anybody wants to contact me, we'll, we'll set it up. That's fantastic. So, uh, yeah, the, 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 the Quran and its tafsir, authentic tafsir from Ibn Kathir and, and those big Islamic scholars of, of the time. And after that, not, not some liberal guys who try to twist the message. And, and, and the hadith, which is the, the actual words of the prophet, the Prophet Muhammad asked people to write down everything he says and he does. Everything he says and he does, from eating to praying to even going to the bathroom. And they write, wrote that down. They wrote that down and, and, and they passed it on to other people. And those people kept passing it on until after a couple of hundred years, somebody decided to put it in a book. Okay, it but was, everything I, you're saying now, do you think Trump has any understanding of this? When he says it's a problem, do you think he has even like the lightest philosophical, historical, cultural comprehension of any of these problems? And I don't think he, I, I mean, he doesn't really. And I don't, I don't see. Yes, right. I agree. He might not know the detail. He might, he might not know what Tahir al-Bukhari is. Do you know? He might not know. But the, the thing is, he knows what the problem is. He knows he have. 
he has located where the problem is. He knows there is cancer somewhere. He's not probably the surgeon who's going to take that cancer off, mm -hmm. He's, but he knows where it is. Obama says, there is no cancer. We're fine. And that's the problem. Can I, can I mention a, a video? And this is actually not to disagree with you. This is actually something I saw recently. And this is actually in your favor. Uh, but I, and I think it was very good. So I think it's worth mentioning. I recently befriended a, a person on Twitter. Her name is uh, Shireen Kadozi. She's a conservative Muslim who's pro-Trump. And I was watching one of her videos. She was interviewed on Fox News. And she made a point that I thought was very poignant. And it kind of made me think a lot that under Obama and possibly and probably under Hillary, that they were favoring the Muslim voices in the country. They were trying to oppose anti-Muslim bigotry or what they call now Islamophobia, which is basically, uh, you know, opposing people who have any kind of criticism of Islam. And she said, those were, are the voices that were getting heard under Obama. And it's not the people who are reformers or critical of the religion or the ex-Muslims. Right. And yeah. and she considers herself a kind of uh, a critical thinker on Islam and a reformer. And and she said, it's more likely people like me, the reformers, the critics, the ex-Muslims are going to get heard under Trump than they were under Obama or under Hillary. And... To that, I can't totally disagree. I mean, Obama, I understand the kind of position he was in. He decided to take the side of the of the Muslim community, right? To to to, to speak up for them against bigotry. But to do that, he had to also not really embrace the community which is critical of of Muslim, which are the reformers, which are the ex-Muslims, which are the the people from immigrants from uh, Middle Eastern countries who have very harsh things to say about their society, right? Who say like, no, the, uh, Islam is the problem and it's very oppressive. He can't embrace those people and the Muslims at the same times. At the same time, one group won't let him do it. The Muslims in this case won't let him uh, give uh, those people a platform. If not, they'll oppose him. And under Trump, they now have a possibility to get a platform. And I can't really disagree with that. <laughs> to, to be yeah. honest, it's, it's actually, not something actually, I, I, I love this idea. And I love yeah. that she said that I haven't watched the video. I'm just confused that she calls herself a conservative Muslim. I don't know what conservative Muslim is. I'm going to, well, in the future, I, I've communicated with her, um, Shireen Kadosi, and she, I, I hope at least she will be on my podcast. So people will get a better idea of her thinking okay. and, and everything. Yeah, that's great. So I think that's, that's, uh, spot on. I think, I think, uh, that people who oppose Islam and not Muslims who oppose Islam as an ideology get attacked. They get attacked on liberal media. They get attacked with people that have nothing to. They know they know nothing about Islam, but they go, Islam is a religion of peace. These are Westerners who would attack me if I comment, for example, on Al Jazeera and saying what Islam is all about. And you know, although some people agree, but a lot of some a lot of uh, you know Muslims obviously disagree with me and they attack me, but 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 also liberal liberals from the West attack me, and that it's you know somebody who gives these folks a platform is going to be criticized by Muslims, by liberals, by SJWs, by uh, uh, regressives like uh, Majid Nawaz calls them. Like people like Majid Nawaz are struggling now. He, he's a Muslim. He's a reformist. And because he's a reformist, he's being attacked. He's being attacked and he's not allowed to say that, that ISIS has something to do with Islam, uh, which, is, which is a fact. It is a fact. They're applying Islam 100%. I mean, there's definitely something wrong there, especially since recently the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is a law center that dedicates itself to um, basically identifying the most radical racist groups and individuals in in the united states and especially a white supremacy groups kkk members etc cetera, etc cetera, things like that and they recently came out with anti-muslim extremist list which included ayan hersi ali and majid nawaz incredible let me let, let me let me give you one 
just uh, clarify something and, and clarify why the West calls everybody that criticizes Islam a bigot and not, not, not people who criticize Christianity as, he, as an idea and uh, Judaism as an idea, as anti-Semitism or as a bigotry. Whenever you mention Islam, Muslims, or when you, whenever you mention the idea, because Islam is just an idea, really. It's, it is not, you know, it's not a person. It's, a, it's an idea. So whenever you mention or criticize Islam or analyze it or even ridicule it, Muslims get offended. Why? Most, most Muslims, even the liberal ones, get offended. Why? Because within Islam, there is a teaching that says, whoever criticizes your religion actually criticizes you. You are Islam and Islam is you. And somehow, with the, with the help of probably the Muslim Brotherhood, whatever, that idea got out and the West, for some reason, now believe that when you criticize Islam, you criticize Muslims as if they were Muslims as well. The liberal media now is behaving like Muslims. And it's not, that's, that people need to point out that when you criticize Islam, you are not criticizing Muslims because most Muslims do not subscribe to the full doctrine. The ones who subscribe to the full doctrines are the ones who deserve to be criticized and ridiculed, like ISIS, but my family, for example. Most Moroccans or most Muslims, modern Muslims I know, I hate to use the word modern Muslims, but that to give you an idea, are the ones, uh, most, most, most Muslims I know are not, are not subscribing to that. And they, they're, they're therefore just regular, peaceful, or peace-loving people. They are peaceful. It's not because of their religion. They're peaceful because they're human. It's, it's part of them. And once they follow it all the way, they'll become like ISIS. And a lot of people have gone through that change. And, and, and just people need, and we have, we kept reiterating it. Uh, Sam Harris articulates it way better than I do, but people won't listen. And that's an issue. But we, keep, we need to keep pounding, pounding that idea. And we need to keep criticizing uh, bad ideas. Islam is a bad idea, so we need to criticize it as a whole. It has some good sides, which most modern Muslims pick and kind of shove the rest under the rug, which is the biggest part. They just take the tip of the iceberg that looks nice and they take it and live with it. But the rest, they go, oh, it's not me. I don't uh, they, they won't discuss it. If you, if you try to make them discuss it, they won't discuss it. But it is a problem. So let me ask you this uh, to kind of get back to the to the Trump stuff, because I find Trump just fantastically unintelligent, inarticulate, thin skinned. Uh, I think he, he's just oh. a, I think he's a bully who doesn't like people kind of he, he likes to dish it out, but doesn't, he can't take it whatsoever. Excuse it, me. Excuse me. Lalo. Excuse yeah. Me. Wrong. <laughs> no, bring it. Bring it. Bring it. Tell me what. What? What? Well, Wrong. I just said wrong. <laughs> wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> well, uh, so my question is this. Do you think uh, do you think Trump is the president you would choose or is he just the lesser of all the evils you saw amongst everyone else? Do you see like with glee? Oh, I really would want a president Trump or just among the barrel of rotten apples I saw. Uh, he's just the least rotten one. No, I, I, I think. Trump is absolutely the president for America today. The absolute, the president for America today. It's the president, the president that America needs and deserves today. Not in a bad way. It deserves it in a good way. Why? What, what, what characteristics does he have that you, you think that make, makes that true? Up, upholding the Constitution, making sure we're not leaving the Constitution to a different kind of uh, uh, you know, change. I mean, the, the values are being changed. We're moving towards socialism in, in, in many ways. So the Constitution needs to be protected. The economic policies, the capitalist economic policies need to be protected, and, and free enterprise ideology needs to be protected. We are moving, we almost did, we almost did with, with, with Sanders. We, had we picked Sanders? would have been living in France, a country where people decide to stay at home and it would be much more lucrative to stay at home than to actually work. 
it's how bad it, got, it has gotten in a place like France. I have a lot of good friends from France. I have a lot of respects for my friends from France. Uh, they might get mad at me uh, about this, but that's the absolute truth. Now, he said a lot of things. Again, we're not going to, into the details about the 100-day plan that I kept mentioning a few times. Things like, things like uh, 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 banning lobbyists, ban, ban, banning uh, people for, that were part of Congress or part of the government from lobbying uh, or working for, for lobbyists. Uh, uh, banning money from coming from lobbyists from overseas. That is an absolutely brilliant idea. Why don't you agree with that one? Oh, I do agree like, with that one. It, I have so, no problem with that one. So yeah. uh, the, the, my question to you is, have you read the 100-day plan? And it, 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 is, is, is my question to everybody that, that talks about Trump. When, when I get a, a call from, from the, the, the Democratic National Committee, because I was, I was also, they had my data, they had my information. So they called me and, and I'm like, have you read the 100-day pl plan? Well, Trump is a horrible guy anyway. So going back to the idea is that when, you, when some people, when they make up their minds about someone, they don't want to listen to them. They don't want to listen to, to what they have to say. I've listened to Hillary. I've listened to her until the, the last minute. I've listened to her. I've listened to Sanders. I've opened my mind to listen to everyone and made my choice. I made my pick. Now, you know, let, 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 me, let me give you another example, you know, uh, back to immigration, all right? Stopping all funding for sanctuary cities, people or cities that would protect illegal, not illegal immigrants who are peaceful, criminal illegal immigrants from being deported. There are cities who are protecting them from being deported. And do these cities deserve funding, government funding that comes from my tax money? No, they don't. So there are so many ideas that I'm like, it's brilliant ideas. He didn't reveal them in the very beginning, but he would touch, he wouldn't, he didn't reveal his full plan in the very beginning, but he was touching on the issues. He would not talk about the solutions so much, but he would keep touching on the issues. And it kind of, a lot. A couple of times it did frustrate me a little bit, but I was eager to see the plan and I was eager to see uh, what, what are the solutions, what the solutions were. Uh, uh, NAFTA deal, when he talks about NAFTA deal, it, it, it is a problem. It was, it, it's, it's not, a lot of the deals America signed are not in favor of the United States. And going back to uh, Obama's policy, Obama's policy, and now everybody loves Obama overseas because Obama is, uh, folk has focused on the America and America's image, uh, may, may, making sure that everybody is happy with what America is doing. Great, but where are the interests of the United States as a country? Are we focused on putting people back to work? Really good, permanent jobs. Are we focused on reducing the deficit? Are we focused on fixing the economy and not band aids fixing? I'm talking about real making the economy really, really strong and, and, and by having very fair deals. One of the ideas that he said, which is, I think it was crazy, but at the same time fascinating, is making countries like Saudi Arabia pay for getting protection. We have bases in Qatar, for example, and in some other places. Qatar, for example, if, if the United States pulls out of Qatar, they, have, they can't protect themselves. They're extremely rich, but they can't protect themselves. So the idea that they need to pay for this is absolutely brilliant. It's focusing on Amer okay, on the interest, uh, to be fair with everybody, uh, I mean, overseas, but America comes first, which is absolutely, it just makes sense. Every other country focuses on, 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 the, on the country first, Morocco first. Uh, Saudi Arabia first, Iran first, but America. When America says America first, everybody gets upset. Where, where does where does this double standard come? This double standard come from? It's frustrating. So yes, these are the ideas. These are the ideas that we need, people needed to hear, and 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 he was speaking people's minds. I've spoken to people who are Muslims, people who are you know from different backgrounds. 
very educated people who voted for Trump, but they felt like they had to hide it until the last minute because people will not focus on the ideas. They just associate Trump with one or a couple of videos they've seen of two minutes. And if you voted for him, you're just a bigot, just like him or an idiot or a brainwashed person. They will not sit down and listen to you or actually analyze the ideas. So that's that's really frustrating. Okay, so you're, like you said, you're fiscally conservative. I think you're more towards the socially liberal side. So let me ask you on this point, like I mentioned before, uh, Donald Trump is against uh, same-sex marriage, but when, after he was elected, he didn't backpedal on it. He just said, well, that's decided. It's not something he's really going to push. What he says he still will push is he does want to overturn Roe v. Wade. He does want to make abortion legal in the country again. And he can do this if he puts in the right Supreme Court justice. And I think that's a major issue that can set back women's rights in the United States decades. And once it's there, once you get a Supreme Court justice who, who you know, they vote on it, they overturn it, it could stay that way for a very long time. It's not easy to bring bring that back. It'll just depend on the Supreme Court. Uh, how do you see that? Does, I mean, does it worry you? That's a very good question. Um, women's rights are, are something really, really, really dear to me. Okay, so I, I take this very personal. I have a daughter and uh, uh, I come from a country where women's rights are not at, at the stage that I would I would want to see. And, uh, of course, as I said, I don't agree with a person on every single thing they do or say, right? However, uh, when it comes to this particular issue, when you say that Trump is going to make abortion illegal, uh, I, I don't know. I, I need to see the exact details. Uh, if he does complete, if he does make abortion completely illegal at every stage, I absolutely disagree with him on this. It wouldn't make me not vote for him though, because you, you, lo you look at, when you look at a candidate, you look at the pros and cons and you look at the priorities, right? So I don't believe he's gonna make abortion illegal across the board. I think there is a base of conservatives that he needed to win. He had, it's not the majority of people who voted for him, but he needed to win that base when he was campaigning and he used a very interesting communicate, communication uh, skills to to get that message across. Uh, but I think I remember a debate with uh, with uh, Hillary Clinton when she said that a woman's body, it's a woman's body, it's her body, her choice. I agree with that to a certain extent, with all due respect to women. Once pregnancy hits seven, eight, nine months, there is a person inside of you. It's not just your body. It's his body too. Okay. So no. But then, you're talking about late term abortions, but right. I mean, but basically, the the when he talks about putting in a Supreme Court justice, he's talking about abortion just across the board. Well, uh, again, I have to uh, then if if it's the yeah. case, I disagree with him, but I would yeah. still. I, I do think to be fair to him, I think he is okay with it in the term in the case of rape, right. and incest. But however that will depend more on the Supreme Court justice he chooses more than his opinion. So, well, I, it, but it's, it's okay, it's kind of sketchy there. Yeah, well, I want to yeah. mention something real quick because yeah. when he was saying that there were full-term, I would call them babies, not fetuses, babies, to me, they're nine-month grown babies, uh, or the scientific term, they were still fetuses because they, they didn't come out of the womb. Yet. But anyway, they can, the, the, he said, there are people who actually abort at that stage that late. And I disagree with that. I would only agree with it if it's to save a woman's life. Or even in, in the case of rape, I it would be debatable. I may agree with that as well. But if it was the case of rape, unless you are psychologically, you went through psychological issues that let you keep, keep the pregnancy, and you didn't even focus on taking the pregnancy or getting rid of the pregnancy, then I, I would I wouldn't I wouldn't allow that. I think in the very beginning of it, when you realize you're pregnant, right? When even in the case of rape, you take a rape kit and they see they check if the woman is pregnant or whatever. I don't know how that works, but I'm assuming 
So the first few months, I would say you have four months, five months to make that decision. Why would you wait until last minute? So if it's, yeah, her body, her choice, but why would she wait until the baby is grown and, and decide to take it, take it out? That's too late. There got to be some sort of cutoff. So I'm kind of in the middle on this. I'm pro-life, pro-choice, but, but I'm, but I'm uh, pro-life only when it's an advanced stage. Of but you are pro-choice in early stages. Correct. First, first yes. month or something. Okay. Exactly. All right. Uh, but you, like you said, you would not, even if you found out that he was against, uh, well, he, let's say he's, he's pro-life, that would not be enough for you not to vote for him. You would just oppose him vocally on that while he's president. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, how has been your interaction with other immigrants and simply let's say you know regular american people who are not immigrants to the us us born when you talk about trump and that you're a trump supporter it really varies i mean some immigrants some immigrants agreed with me and they voted for him too and they understand exactly where where i'm coming from because they have an idea about like moroccans some moroccans voted for him as well my friends voted for him i didn't influence them in any way shape or form uh, they have, they've, they've, they know, they've known, or they know the issues Trump is talking about because they came from that background. We understand the issues in places like Saudi Arabia and other places. We because we speak the language, speak flu, I mean classic Arabic. We understand a lot of these things, and we understand when Trump mentions those things uh, that they are true. And a lot of ex-Muslims actually voted for him, and that's not because. There are ex-Muslims. There are some Muslims who actually voted for him as well. And I've met, I mean, I've spoken to Americans who cannot believe they voted for Trump, but they didn't take the time to analyze and understand why. Uh, some of them, actually, I get a lot of messages from Europe, my friends in Europe. Some of them actually sat down and they, got a par they had a paradigm shift when I walk them through why and give them the 100 day plan. And they were like, oh, this makes sense. This makes sense. This makes sense. And they were like, okay, I'm going to just be neutral on this. Or, you know what? I agree with you. Or, uh, or, or things of that nature. So, uh, yeah. So with, with Americans, it, you know, it varied as well. But most of the people I spoke to, to said, well, I live in Atlanta. So in the South, a lot of, a lot of supporters, uh, uh, a lot of conservative supporters uh, of Trump. Uh, some of them said, well, you know what? Oh, you voted for Trump? Now it, they felt like they, they now can talk about it, especially at work, because it felt like you voted for Trump, you're so evil, you you have to hide it. <laughs> now that they, they hear that they voted for Trump as well, they actually feel comfortable talking about and, and, and d debating ideas around the plan, around his speeches, around his character, around a lot of these things. Do you think so, American people have a problem of being able to debate and converse about serious issues openly? Uh, I can't. I can't say all Americans because that would be, you know, painting them with it with a single brush. But a lot of Americans are politically correct because it's just part of who they are, I guess, or the way they were brought up. Even at school, and at school, you're not allowed to say certain things. Uh, you know. Uh, teachers are not very honest with the with the with, with some with the students. Uh, if they are not doing well, they're not going to say. Because growing up in Morocco, if you're dumb, they'll tell you you're dumb. You know what I mean? You're going to hear it. Uh, I'm not saying I'm not advocating for it. I'm not saying you have to tell that to the kids. But just to give you kind of an extreme example, and and uh, you know, uh, it's nice because again, I'm socially liberal. It's nice to. To, to use nice words when you when when you speak to certain people, make sure that not, you're not hurting sensitivities and things like that. It's a good thing. But when it comes to serious issues, you cannot just hold yourself from saying uh, things just because you're you're scared you're gonna you're gonna actually offend people. Like uh, you know the whole safe space mindset uh, that I can't that I can't understand. Like. You, you, in campuses, you're not allowed to, to to wear certain costumes, and it created so much debate around that. Uh, where is the freedom of speech? Where is the freedom of expression? Where did that go? Oh no, well, yeah, it's freedom of freedom of speech or your freedom of 
of expression stops when you offend someone. That's not true. If yeah. you do that, that, that as, do as both uh, people, you and I, who come from a different culture, I from Chile, uh, you 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 from Morocco. Uh, I, I personally, I'm, it doesn't you know phase me, or I don't get offended if when quote unquote people are culturally appropriating which is a stupid word that I mean is is completely meaningless uh you know cultural appropriation implies that someone owns culture which right. is not a thing that, that, yeah. that is that is and it's, yeah. it's, it's it's new i've met i've met a lot of millennials who are very smart or who are smarter than me absolutely and i've met a lot of them who actually were raised not to debate and not to challenge ideas unfortunately and they they have a a misunderstanding of what freedom of speech is. Freedom of speech is not the freedom of not being criticized. If you know, freedom, I'm gonna say, oh, freedom of speech, and uh, and uh, yeah, you, you can't criticize my idea. It's 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 uh, it's freedom of speech. Or, or freedom of speech is not, you know, stopping others. Or freedom of religion is not stopping others from doing something just because it offends you or it offends your religion. That's not true. That's misconceptions. So I would say if the best thing to hand, handle this is if you disagree with somebody, instead of stopping him from doing it, go ahead and debate it with him. Go and say, you know what? I don't like that costume. Let's talk about it. Let's have a debate about this. Instead of going to the college or the, the president of the, of the college and go, you need to ban this. That's when people learn laziness uh, when it comes to debating. They don't want to debate. They want just to, when an idea offends me, I want to stop it. I just, that's how I handle it. That's, that's not the way you handle things. That's not how you, you face society. That's just not the case because you cannot just ban everything you don't like. Simple is, as that. Isn't it quite amazing that this kind of yeah. shutdown of criticism is so similar between the most fundamentalist of Muslims and the mo the most left wing of liberals in the United States that they share that this is, in code. That is that is incredibly amazing. I know that they want to be nice to us brown people, and they want to be nice and they want to be they they want to show that they are very open minded and and how dare you uh, criticize these folks? How dare you uh, make fun of their culture? Well. I don't need you to defend me. I'm not a four-year-old. I don't I, know. Why. I completely share that sentiment. I do not. <laughs> I do not need the condescending attitude that I need the protection that's of my also, feelings. That's racist, actually. <laughs> it's very condescending. It's very condescending it's, that as a, like as a brown person from a different culture, I need this white liberals standing in front of me, pointing, wagging their finger at others, saying, "Do not dare, you know, uh, uh, offend Lalo and Khalid. How dare you? There's they're brown men." No, the the one who's the only one who's offending me is the one who's trying to protect my feelings as if I'm a child. That's the only yeah. people I find offensive. There's a lot of, you know, and, and I totally agree with you. And people who, you know, believe that it's okay to criticize white people. It's okay to paint one full race, uh, I mean, uh, entire race, on something and say, oh, white people are racist. Nobody says anything about that. Nobody says it, it's it's racist to call white people all of them racist nobody says it's a problem but when you mention something when somebody says something uh or when somebody criticizes uh, a belief or wears a costume that's supposed to be worn by a different culture everybody goes after them and goes oh my god i can't believe you said that i can't believe uh you've been a bigot you've been a racist it's just it just it's it just doesn't sound fair and to me i i believe in in fairness, I believe in justice, and I believe in equality. We all have to look at things when, from an objective standpoint and quit focusing on who said that. Oh, it's a white guy. We need to blame him. If you take the same exact thing and a black guy says it, no problem. So that's actually racist, and we need to be handling the problem with an actual objective or handling the messages with an objective mindset instead of just seeing who says it, who did it, and try to create that racial division and victimhood and, and, and feed the victimhood and, and narrative and uh, fear mongering. So Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. To me, respect to me is holding me to the highest standard as they would any other color of skin or gender, etc. Exactly. So 
we'll end it here, although I'd really like to continue our conversation and ask you more about leaving Islam, ask right. you more about uh, the racial differences and uh, the kind of the phenomenon of social justice and racial inequality that that uh, that is talked about so much in the U.S. that they seem to be very <laughs> hyperbolic about. Yeah. Um, yeah, I could I could say that I've never I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I've never experienced racism. I've never witnessed racism and I've been here for over 10 years. So that's just an, that's just my hum, humble experience. OK, I'm not saying that racism does not exist at all. I have not I have not I've never seen it. I'm taking a leap of faith. It does exist, I guess, but I've never experienced it. So, so but like to, to at least uh, to speak for your own experience, you've had a very positive experience in the U.S. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. OK. Well, I mean, that's still that's still uh, noteworthy, even though it's maybe not represent everyone. It's still uh, uh, a an, an important point to highlight that you've had a in general, a very positive experience there. That is correct. So, OK, well, I thank you to Khalid for joining me. Is there any um, social media you'd like to put out there for people to follow you on Twitter, Facebook? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know if you want to uh, post my uh, the links to my uh, to my Facebook. Uh, I'm not very active on Twitter, but I'm getting into it. Uh, so you can I'll give you the links or you can share my Facebook. I on. will put the, the links for all his social media in the description if you'd like to follow Khalid, Khalid, so thank you so much for this conversation. I learned a lot. Uh, <laughs> you're still completely wrong on Trump. You're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong. Uh, but yeah, well, I mean, Trump is a wild card. We will see what happens. It's definitely going to be a fascinating four years. Yeah, we, we need to give the guy the benefit of the doubt. Even if you did, didn't vote for him, you have no choice at this point. Instead of crying, I would say focus on the issue. The issues that we have let's let's work together to, to 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 you know for the good of this country you know there's no point in protesting at this point uh, we need to work together uh, uh, as a nation uh, if you all love the united states as as, as a and from a, coming from an immigrant this is an amazing country uh, uh, you know we need to respect the the, the voters uh, choice uh, they picked the, the i mean coming from the number of delegates that's how the U.S. Uh, you know ele elect um, elections work, and that's the plan was to win the electoral votes. And uh, let's not let's not focus now on the number, how many voters uh, uh, voted for Trump versus how many voted for Hillary, because the the focus of each candidate was to get the electoral vote. It's like playing soccer, and all of a sudden, because you don't like the the scoring or uh, you know, you, you don't like that you lost. You go, oh, you know what? The rules are basketball rules now. So let's see what happens. No, that's not how it works. So we need to, uh, you know, we need to accept it and we need to move forward and we need to work for, together as a team for the good of this amazing uh, nation. And I really mean it. Sounds good. Thank you, Khalid, again for, for joining. Thank you.